Welcome to the Voice of Counseling, presented by the American Counseling Association. This program is hosted by Dr. S. Kent Butler. This week's episode is Personal Reflections on Counseling and features Dr. Gerald Corey. Welcome to the Voice of Counseling from the American Counseling Association. I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler, and today joining me is Dr. Gerald Corey. First, before I even go into explaining who this person is, I will tell you this. I met Cheryl Corey many, many years ago in passing. And he was one of those individuals that I would see at conferences and just be in awe of because that's who I read when I was in my master's program, when I was in my PhD program, I read from his works. And so seeing him walking around a conference was mind boggling. And I got to know him by share, uh, somebody introduced us or whatever have you. But the thing that was the most amazing was that the very next year, and this man only seen me in a very quick moment. I don't know if he has a photographic memory or whatever it is, but he, he remembered my name and I was just a lowly new PhD person. And um, Gerald Corey, this prolific writer, um, remembered me. And so I, that, I'll never forget how he made me feel that he would remember who I was. And every time since then. So Jerry Corey is a professor emeritus of human services and counseling at the California State University at Fullerton. He currently holds the position of distinguished visiting professor of counseling at the University of Holy Cross in New Orleans. Gerald Jerry has seven books that are published by the American Counseling Association. Today, he's here to speak about one of those books, Personal Reflection on Counseling, which can be purchased through the ACA store. So with all that, this man who has all these distinguished things behind him, Lifetime Achievement Award, from the American Mental Health Counselors Association in 2011, the Eminent Career Award from ASGW in 2001, Outstanding Professor Year Award um, from the California State University in 1991, and just this past year in 2021 in April, he received the ACA Thomas Hohenseel National Publication Award. Isn't any wonder. Jerry, how are you? It's good to see you. Good so far. <laughs> Good so far. Excellent. I am so, um, I don't know if the word is enamored or whatever with you, because you've always come through. Um, anytime I've asked or anytime um, you have been um, able to be a part of something um, for ACA, not too long ago, we did the, right. um, the, <clears throat> the thing over the pandemic with reaching out with self-care to counselors. And that's your thing, right? You are all about counselors taking care of themselves and, and making sure that they are well so they can do well, do, do right by their clients. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it's, the opportunity. It's good to see you and good to have you here. And, um, you know, I was reading something the other day or, you know, just in knowing you, you had said something to the effect of you have not missed one ACA conference in quite a few years. I think about 45. I started at Las Vegas somewhere way back when. Way and back when. And I went there we went except the last two, which didn't happen. Didn't happen, right? So you did it virtually, but you didn't. And so um You've been doing a lot of good things. And, and, and this particular book that you have now, um, Personal Reflections, can you talk a little bit about it and what, what inspired it and, and, and why do people need to go out and get it? Well, I don't know if they need to go out and get it, but uh, what inspired it was I <clears throat> was doing a week-long residential class in Nashville. And the person who was there said, why don't you come? We're having several colleges and universities together. And we want to ask you questions about counseling and your career. And 
I said, okay. So they had about 30 questions. And before I finished, I said, hey, that might make a good book, questions okay. and answers. So yeah. this book is about questions that I've been asked <clears throat> by students primarily over okay. many years, common questions. And it's very personal. Yeah. So can you give me a, a sense of what one of those questions might have looked like? Yeah. Oftentimes people say, uh, what about when I start? How do I make a car about my career? Or hmm. how do I get a mentor? Or okay. how do I challenge my self-defeating beliefs yeah. that I'm an imposter and I don't belong <laughs> in this profession? Yeah. Or, you know, how do I handle it all? Right, right, right. That, that, that's really, um, those are really good questions. I think that, you know, especially starting off, that is something that new new professionals or new counselors would like to know. But starting off for you, who were some of your mentors? You know, uh, there were no big names. Nobody would know. Them. But uh, one of them was an undergraduate uh, psychology professor. Okay. Uh, and I was just so enthralled with his ability to pull things together. I majored in psych. And okay. then I was in my doctoral program, Dr. Jane Waters, she was from the South. And I was so uptight about statistics. I thought I couldn't hack it. And, couldn't I hack it. and said, I don't know if I can go through statistics. And she looked at me and said, I think you can. And she gave me a lot of encouragement. Okay. So she was, otherwise I might've said, I don't think I'm cut out for a doctoral program. Which right. Her encouragement kept me in there. Kept you in. Kept you in. So I, I would probably love to have gone back to my master's program and been taught under you. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to be a student under Gerald or Jerry Corey? Well, you know, <clears throat> I would hope you'd enjoy the class. And I know I would. I just, I just finished a couple of classes that. University of Holy Cross, and we have two more coming up, ethics and then theories of counseling. Okay. And I don't lecture with PowerPoints. I okay. try to be as personal as possible. And uh, what I try to do is engage the students. So I ask them, uh, what are your questions? You read the material, come in and let's talk about your struggles. What do you most want to know? And I think what I'm doing at Holy Cross is I'm teaching ethics every session. I have 10 sessions. It's a weekend class. I have an outstanding guest speaker coming in. Okay. Careful, I might ask you to come in, <laughs> but I've got them all booked up. All Courtney right. Lee is coming in to talk Who? about Courtney Lee. Okay, okay. Ethics and multicultural counseling and ethics yes. and social justice. Nice. Uh, Ted Remley is going to talk about law and ethics. Nice. Barbara Hurley here is talking about her perspective on ethics. My wife uh, and colleague, Marianne Schneider Corey, is going mm -hmm. to come in to talk about values and how nice. to manage your values. Could I be a fly on the wall? You, can, you, you surely could. We can send you a Zoom link. Yeah. And see all these fabulous speakers. You'll yes. know most of them. Yeah, I, I know most of them. I, know, I actually I know all of them. But <laughs> Mary Herman. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the bottom line is, I try to make the course uh, exciting, nice. and engaging. And so can you? So as an instructor, sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get students to talk. So once they get past the awestruckness of being with Jerry Corey, how do you get them to actually ask you questions and? be involved in the classroom um, instruction and talk. Now, in all honesty, I don't know that I managed that yet. Sometimes uh, I have, out of 30 maybe, a few that are great participants. They're there, yeah. see them, I don't forget them. Yeah. But sometimes I say, I haven't heard some other voices. Yeah. I'd like to hear, you just saw a video or you just heard a guest speaker. Yes. Dr. Butler just came in and talked about his journey. What were your, what were you left with? And then silence. So silence. I okay. haven't figured well, out. That happens with Jerry Corey as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, I've, you know, figured out, well, maybe I'll have them uh, write out questions. One question okay. per chapter. Yes. And then they're asked to write about that. 
So, yeah. uh, but eventually it wore them up. And uh, some are, you know, uh, they're not used to that. Yeah, they're not used to it. How can we change that dynamic though? What in your mind is in, that we need to do as instructors that can help students kind of get out of their own way when they say, you know, I don't like to talk in large spaces or, or with large crowds of people or all those types of things because it's so important for them to be able to use their voice and find, because they must have something that happened, right? You asked, you just heard right. this person come and talk to you. What's going on for you? Is it that they feel as though their words don't matter? I mean, what do you think is some of the reasons why students are hesitant to kind of speak up? Well, I think a lot of them are socialized to sit and listen. Okay. A lot of them don't believe they have anything worthwhile to say. A lot of them are intimidated. That okay. could be part of it too. Yeah. But I think we have a lot to do with that. And I love co-teaching. Uh, okay. Mariana and I presented at conferences uh, when we co-teach, we are informal and we have a dialogue with each other. Okay. Uh, I, I have did a video with Stan, counseling Stan. Yeah. Uh, anybody who took theories of counseling probably saw him. He's now one of my valued colleagues. And at ACA, we present every year for the last 10 or 15 years. He's okay. a PhD in counseling site. He was an undergrad student of mine way back when. And we work, I think, beautifully together. We bounce off of each other. He has different things to, and I think that warms up the audience, yeah. co-teaching. Yeah. So I think we need to be personal and engaging and real. Yeah. If we're stuffy and formal, I think our students are going to pull back. That's nice to, That's to hear. hear. That's good to hear. Can you, where, where do you get your energy from? Well, that's a good question. I think I love what I do. Okay. I love teaching. That's why I'm not ready for retirement at 84 years old. Okay. There you go. Um, uh, I don't know if I'll, I don't think I'll ever retire. And uh, I think part of it is I love what I do. I like engaging with people who are, willing to stretch and get out of their comfort zone and who are excited about learning. Yeah. Uh, the books are a part of that too, uh -huh. and working with colleagues. Yeah. And self-care, you mentioned that, that's yeah. so important. Yes. I'm not a couch potato. I do a lot of exercise and uh, I think relationships are important. Wow. And, you know, I, I try to take good care of myself. Well, and, as a parent, we I look at you and we see you with all this energy. I mean, uh, every time I see you, especially in person, just going, you know, a hundred miles per hour, it seems, um, always getting something done. Um, you're a very, very busy person. And I think staying busy also keeps you, maybe that's part of your self-care? Oh, yeah. Meaningful busy. Meaningful busy. Not going to meetings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> engaging with colleagues, uh, thinking of new projects. Yes. So you're a phenomenal writer. How did you know? What made you become the Gerald Corey that we see in the textbooks? How did you know that this was your pathway? Because you, you, you do some masterful work and you have really trained a lot of students, not even from them being in your classroom, but being in classrooms that utilize your work. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, when I first started writing, it was, I think in 1974, I wrote a book called Teachers Can Make a Difference. Okay. And it didn't sell very much, but at least it taught me, hey, I might be able to write a book. It was with Carl Rogers' Freedom to Learn series. Okay. But my first big book was Theory and Practice of Counseling and Psychotherapy. Yes. And I wrote handouts to give my students in class on each theory. And one day, uh, Brooks Cole, which is now Cengage, came by and said, are you doing any writing? And I said, here are all my handouts for every theory. And they didn't have a theory book in those days. So they went back and they eventually said, we want to offer a contract. And uh, that book uh, blows my mind. It's going to be in the 11th edition. I'm working on it now for 
11th edition. And I've never tried to be too scholarly. Uh, I want to be scholarly, yes, yes. but I try to be personal. So right. I imagine my audience, and Marianne is that way too, when we write, we right. imagine our audience and we're talking to them. Mm. So we want to be personal and engaging yes. rather than citing literature right. uh, after every single sentence. After every single sentence, yes. And, and, and saying it in such a way that you can then turn that into practice. So when you go into a practicum and you go into your internship, you are able to remember this from that perspective and be able to be there for your clients when you're, when you're in those situations. Right. That's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. Um, so what would you say to students um, on their professional journey um, in terms of how they come to become a counselor? What, what would be some of the ideas you could offer them as they're going through this? Oh, this is way too short, this session, uh, because I could easily <laughs> speak an hour and a half on that. As okay. a matter of fact, Jamie Bloodworth, PhD, and who's my stand in the video and a former student, uh, now we are great friends and colleagues. Right. We're going to present 90 minutes at uh, ACA in Atlanta on becoming a professional counselor. Wow, a few we just right into it. Okay. There's one, get a mentor. Get a mentor. Jamie would say, get a mentor that's a little bit intimidating. Uh, don't, uh, and don't say no, say uh -huh. yes. More often you say no. So if somebody says, I want you to join me in a writing project, say, I'm on. <laughs> uh, if they want you to go to a conference and co-present, say yes. Uh, okay. I think the other thing is find your passion. Yes. That's what I think is so important. And then try to have a dream. I think that's crucial, a dream, a dream. And then work and push yourself to take the steps that are necessary to make the dream a reality. Nice. And I, I think that you can dream and dream big yeah. without it being a hindrance to someone else's dream. Exactly. Like my guess, Kent, is that you didn't think you would become an ACA president when you were a master's student. I didn't think I was um, uh, four years ago. <laughs> yeah, and here you are. And you're doing these podcasts and doing good things, and, uh, you know, collaborating uh, and making a difference. So I think we dream too small, yeah. you know? And so many of my students, and that's why what I, why I'm in this profession still. So right. many of my students have gone on and they're doing marvelous things. Great things, uh, yeah. In terms of making a difference in the world. Yeah. Social yeah. interest. They're out there changing the world. Excellent. So with that in mind, what do you think blocks the effectiveness of new clinicians? How come some people don't get to blossom and become you know, the great counselors that they, they, they could be? What do you think is blocking that effectiveness? Well, I think one is we might give in too often to the voices that we hear inside. Uh, who am I to think I can write a book? Who am I that I think I can, uh, you know, yeah. go to a conference and give a presentation? Yeah. Would anybody want to listen to me? So you got to challenge that crap. Okay. So you and I, so I'm going to write a book with you then. We got to figure out a book that we can write together. I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Um, you know, when you um, wrote that book with Jules and Julius um, Austin, yeah. I was like, wow, that you would take somebody under your, uh, under your wings and, and, and shepherd them through the writing process and getting their career started in that manner. Um, so not only do you do this work to help all counselors become better counselors, you are also mentoring people into the process of writing and using their voice in, in the written word as well. Right. And that book, Counselor Self-Care, yeah. Jim and Julius Austin were a uh, part of it, and Michelle Moratori. Yes. So the four of us. And she was an undergrad student of mine at Cal State Florida nice. many years ago. Now she's at Johns Hopkins University yes. teaching, getting outstanding evals. So the four of us did a keynote on counseling yep. self-care. And yeah, 
I'll take a little bit of credit for kind of encouraging them, but they've done it themselves. Yeah. You know, they've but, been I, the but I think that's part of it though. You know, you say a small part, but you know, just getting uh, a word from Gerald Corey as to you can do this. Yeah. Pat on the back from Gerald Corey that you, that this could happen for you goes a long way. Yeah. I hope so. And I want to encourage people, don't let failure stop you. Because okay. sometimes uh, we put in a proposal for a conference and it comes back and we say, sorry, we're not sorry. accepted. As a matter yeah. of fact, I got one rejection or one non-acceptance of a book panel that we've done for 15 years. Right, and right. I didn't get discouraged about that. I said, okay, uh, we don't always get it. But I think too many new professionals will become uh, overwhelmed with what they consider failure. Failure. And, and I think we need to be risk takers. Risk I takers, we, yes, I believe that 100%. So, you know, that's really good advice that you shared right there. What was the most significant advice you ever received in your career? Uh, maybe one thing was don't let your fear of failure stop you. Okay. I mentioned statistics. That was a big yeah. thing. And uh, even when I got my doctorate in 1967, uh -huh. uh, many years back, 1967, when I started seeing clients, I had a job as a counselor in a counseling center at a university. Okay. I thought I was worthless as a counselor. I didn't think... I was making any difference. Clients weren't getting any better. And I thought, maybe I'm in the wrong profession. Uh, yeah. So discouragement set in. And I love Adler, Alfred Adler's idea uh -huh. about encouragement is what helps people build on their strengths. Right. So I think a piece of advice I got is hang in there. Hang in there. You don't have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. Reach out for encouragement, support, and right. direction. Right. So how did you how did you think you kind of kind of worked through the fear? Uh, by talking with colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mariana and I talked a lot and my other colleagues that we presented with uh, about our beginning fears of do we have anything to say? Right. Uh, we had that with a few books. We had one book and uh, we got stuck because we said, ah, this book is too much like our other books. Yeah. And we're almost going to dump it. But uh, the editor said, hang in there a little bit longer. Okay. And it doesn't have to be a hundred page, 200 page book, a hundred pages of work. So uh, I think challenging the fear, you know, uh, and thinking what's the worst thing that can happen. Yeah. And I think, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, go finish your thought. I was just gonna say, I think a biggie is having colleagues. I think one of the most important things I've ever done is connection with colleagues mm -hmm. that we, we co-teach together. Right. Uh, some of my former students are co-teaching with me. I have four TAs right now at nice. University of Holy Cross that are teaching, reading papers. So it's not a solo endeavor. Right. And that gives energy. But that's also helping someone else grow in their, yeah. in, you know, from your experiences and things that you bring to the table. Right. So um, your book is going into the 11th edition. You're working on that. How, what evolves in that? How do you stay relevant and new? How do you add to so that you get to 11th edition? Well, I think teaching really helps because then I get an idea of what excites students. And the trouble with theories is they haven't changed all that much, most you of them. No, not okay. much. But working with good colleagues, like I have a chapter on feminist therapy, and I'm uh, my co-author on that is Barbara Hurley. Yes. And Carolyn Enns, who's a big name in feminist therapy, has reviewed that chapter and is working with us to update it. So. Colleagues are very helpful. Nice. Uh, 
Jim Bitter is a valued colleague, Jim Bitter, uh -huh. Adlerian and family therapist. Right. Uh, he wrote a book for ACA called Theory and Practice of Family Counseling and Couples Counseling. Yeah. And uh, he co-authored the family systems chapter with me, did most of the work, and Adlerian. So right. that's how I stay relevant that's with okay. colleagues. Uh, nice. Now, we have another book that we're working on currently, uh, Marianne and our daughter, Cindy. It's okay. ethic, Issues in Ethics in the Helping Profession. That's also going to be in the 11th edition. Now, the ethics book is very different, that there are always new challenges. Right. Social yes. justice is a big issue currently. So yes. one thing we came up with, a new idea, is Voices from the Field. Nice. For our ethics book. So we've already gotten 35 different voices from the field to come in and write 600 to 800 words about a topic that's in our chapter. Nice. Uh, and these are all people who've written books for ACA. Right. Nancy Wheeler yes. who wrote about con consulting with colleagues. Yes. Cortland Lee did a piece on social justice and multicultural. Mm -hmm. Mary Herman did something on duty to protect and warn. So all these people are authors. Authors. And, and that's that's a neat thing, right? Because yeah. people could be, you know, Gerald Corey is, um, you know, nothing to shake a feather at, right? And so <laughs> you come to someone who's also a writer and who also is contributing to this field and you can collaborate. Yeah. That says a lot. Right. And I think what helps is thinking about what are the new challenges out there. Right. Like the pandemic obviously has exactly. really produced major challenges of isolation and how do you teach even? Right. And how do you do therapy uh, in person versus online? So we had uh, people who wrote the book, Distance Counseling and Supervision, yes. ACA book. Uh, they are voices from the field in our ethics book. So that's how I try to, each book, I th each edition, we right. try to think of new things to keep it. New things to keep, thing, keep it popping. Right. Yeah. Current. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And so, um, you know, one of the things that you are very, very adamant about is um, work-life balance uh, in your personal life. And, you know, I want to get into that maybe after the break, uh, yeah. talking a little bit more about what that's like for you. But um, I would love to hear from you in terms of, you know, your thoughts on why it's important. Before we go to break, maybe you can give us a couple of, of, of snippets of why it's important to be balanced. Okay, well, uh, I'd like, I hope before the end, we can talk more about self-care. Oh, yeah, yes. I think that's so important. But I don't think we want to be lopsided, you know. Uh, I think we want to have a balanced life. Fun, I think that's important. Relationships, that's an important part. Work, meaningful work. Right. And I think also, uh, you know, uh, getting, this gets into self-care. Uh, yeah. Adequate rest and exercise is so important. Right. Uh, but you know, I think uh, the key there about balance is I think we have to learn to say no to. Uh, I know you get a lot of offers mm -hmm. and sometimes to go and do keynotes in China or Singapore or whatever. And we had to learn the hard way, hard way that we can't say yes to all of this because Nowadays, getting on a plane and going international travel is tough on our system. Yeah. So even attractive offers, we had to say, I appreciate the offer, but I, I can't do any more than I can do. So I think learning to say no is important as well as it is to say yes, or to say, hey, the idea, your invitation is exciting. Let me think about it and I'll get back with you tomorrow. Okay. Uh, you know, and, and giving it giving it a once over to, to see if this is really something that is something that you're willing to commit to and right. and, and to put uh, put into your uh, 
I guess, your list of things that you'll, you'll continue to do. Counselors help positively impact lives by providing support, wellness, treatment. We're working to change lives. We are creating a world where every person has access to the quality, professional counseling, and mental health services needed to thrive. Welcome back to The Voice of Counseling. This is Dr. S. Kent Butler. Uh, we're here with the phenomenal Jerry Corey, who was talking a little bit about work-life balance before the break. And I really want to ask you, what kind of advice do you have for counselors as they continue to navigate the current ongoing challenges with COVID-19, things like the national natural disasters that are happening right now, school shootings, of course, and just the fact that there's social injustices all over the place. Um, what are some of your tidbits of information? What's your wisdom that you can share for counselors? Well, you know, I think it's easy to get overwhelmed with all that we cannot do. Okay. Because we might say, oh my gosh, what can I do about racial injustice? What can I do about uh, white supremacy? What can I do about... <clears throat> Uh, one, one million uh, new cases of COVID each day, 1.4 million, you know? Uh, then we get overwhelmed and we say, I can't do anything. Right. Maybe what we need to do is focus on what we can do right. and realize that even small steps are important. And uh, again, I think it helps so much to uh, have colleagues that we can talk to and process. Uh, we may not be able to see our colleagues as often as we would like, but we can Zoom with them. Yes. And that's better than saying, well, I've got to be isolated. I've got to be isolated. You know, um, as you were saying that, one of the things that came up for me was like, you know, counselors need to learn how, to, and I say this a lot, get out of their own way. Yes. And I think that's what I picked up on what you when you were saying those things is like we 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 make it about us too many times that we then are not seeing the forest for the trees. Yeah. Yeah, we get in our own way a lot, and I think we need to challenge that. Definitely you know? challenge that. Um, so when you think about self-care. I know that you, I know because I know that you shared that you are an avid walker. You ride a bike, you, you take care of yourself. You get your rest when you need to. Um, what is it about self-care and when did it come into your life to be so impactful? Especially to the point where you are, you're so vulnerable in sharing what you do to try to help people um, in their own journey. Yeah. Well, uh, I think exercise, let's just take that. That's only one prong. I have a physician and he's a very holistic wellness oriented physician, okay. not just pushing medicine. Uh -huh. And he was interviewed recently about what is wellness and well being. And he said, there are four pillars of it. And I like that. He said, first of all, nutrition. Okay. You know, I think we can't afford just to eat fast food and skip meals. Uh, we need to pay attention to what we take in. That's okay. so important, uh, you know, what we drink and eat. Uh, secondly, is exercise. He says we're meant to move. And if we just ignore that totally, it, okay. we're gonna pay a price. Okay. We're not gonna be able to maintain stamina or physical health. Right. And he said the third component is restorative sleep. I don't think we're going to afford to pull all-nighters too often. Right. You know, maybe when you're a young college student, but right. at my age, I don't think that would work. So right. I think I need to get adequate rest and sleep. Okay. And the last one, very important, stress management. Mm. You know, so much is written about we cannot eliminate 
stress from our life. Our life is stressful, let's face it. But I think we can learn to control it. Mm-hmm. Either stress controls well, us. We're allow what we let in and, and what we don't let in. Right. Into that stress piece. And sometimes students will say about self-care uh, or stress management, uh, well, or new professionals say this, I've got to get tenure. I've got to write so many things. Yes. Uh, I've got to go to meetings. I've got yeah. to do all of this. Well, okay. Uh, but maybe how can we have the courage to be imperfect? That's important too. I don't think we have to be perfect. Uh, And I think there are a lot of things we can do by way of stress management that don't cost anything. Meditation Mm -hmm. can be one of those. Mindfulness, trying to do one thing at a time rather than multitask. Uh, You know, uh, listening to good music maybe playing music. One of my colleagues plays a bass fiddle professionally. Wow. Uh, jazz band, that stand, okay? Uh, or having fun. Reality therapists talk about uh, human needs. One of them is having fun and not feeling guilty about doing something that we enjoy doing. Relationships, our personal relationships with family, friends, mm-hmm. and colleagues, right. that's vital. Uh, if we don't do that, we're going to burn out. Wow. Uh, so, you know, one of my colleagues wrote a book, uh, Mark Stabickney, and it's called yeah. Counsel- ACA, Counseling yeah. During an Age of uh, the Various Phases of a Pandemic. By the yeah. way, he's going to be one of my speakers in ethics. Yeah, and, good, uh, good, good. I got a chance uh, to talk with him not too long ago. Yeah, he's going to talk about that topic. Uh, and, you know, that's scary. Yeah. So what can we do? Like we're going to go tonight to a concert, a philharmonic. We're wearing a mask. We've been fully vaccinated and boosted. And everybody who goes to the concert has to show proof of vaccination Good. and wear a mask. Right. So it's either that or not go to anything. Nice. You know? Yes. And we're going to go to another concert tomorrow nice. night. So I think so Gerald Corey at 84 is getting it in, people. He's getting it in. He's not playing. <laughs> so I think balance is important, having yes. fun. Uh, and I must admit, when I first started, I threw myself into my work. Yes. Because, you know, I, I got excited about it. And I tried to do everything, writing, teaching, directing a program, right. workshops all over the country and internationally. And, you know, I could do that at 30 and 35 and 40 and even 50. But then I kind of realized maybe I need to uh, take some things off the plate. I can't do it all at once. You know, I was listening to you name off the four things. And just even sitting here, there are things that I could do to improve, right? To improve what's happening. And, and I think that goes back to that mindfulness piece. And that goes back to being really, um, not necessarily methodical, but at least being discerning enough to know that it's important to kind of take these things seriously, right? To, yeah. to make sure that we're not hurting ourselves more than that, you know, because we impact our lives by the things that we do, the things that we take in. Exactly. And I think that by way of exercise, for example, you just said, is we don't have to do something that's drudgery. We need to find something we can enjoy. Maybe walking in nature uh, briefly, or uh, some people like jogging. Now, I hate that. When I see people do that, I say, (laughs) oh my gosh, I couldn't do that. They're jogging past the yes, yes. I, I I tried to jog one time in life and I felt like I was being weighted down to the world. I was like, what is happening? My legs don't want to move forward. What's happening here? And it's like, there are some people, but I, if I did it outside, it was worse. If I did it on a treadmill, I was great. And, okay. and, you know, and so that was really funny, right? But um, my big thing now is riding bikes. Um, I've been yeah. riding. And then I think we can become addicted to it. William Glasser, reality therapy, talked about positive addictions. Right. One, one of them can be exercise. Yes. Uh, you don't have to be a 
exercise freak, I exercise 17 hours a week the yeah. last six years as an average. Yeah. But you don't also have to do somebody else's um, routine. Exactly. I used to go to the gym and I would see two people walk around. I would see one that looked like Hercules and one that looked yeah. like um, Pee Wee Herman. And they'd be walking around together and they'd be doing the same exercises, right? And I'm like, one's working for one and one's not working for the other. So you have to find your thing. Find what you need to be doing. To right. Do and maybe that's okay for them. But it seems like when you sit around doing some that's an exercise or doing something that benefits the one person, well, what about what benefits you? Exactly. Yeah. And I think we should challenge that myth about I don't have time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we may not have time for an hour a day, but yeah. maybe we can find 20 minutes a day, four times a week. Yeah. Anything is better than nothing. Right. You know, that's really funny that you say that because um, I've been going out on my bicycle these past three days and I've only been able to get in like 45 minutes of riding. But I typically try to do an hour or more, right? Yeah. And so I, I could easily have said to myself, ah, you don't have a full hour, so don't go. But 45 minutes is good. 45 <laughs> minutes is good. It is. I had, to, I had to rethink that. I had to think about how I was allowing myself to um, manipulate myself out of doing what I needed to do or what I could do in the, in the time that I did have that I could allot to it. Right, right. And you know, uh, this costs money, but uh, prevention is important. Uh, I'm into acupuncture. I went okay. yesterday for, with needles all over, but mm. that really helps because I had some knee pain. I don't have knee pain now. I can bike ride, walk without that. Okay. So prevention is more important than waiting till we fall apart and then right. try to you know, forward thinking, yeah, that's yeah. what we need. And, uh, you know, Pilates, Joseph Pilates started, uh, in fact, I have that on my resume. I got the Joseph Pilates Award uh, in 2012. My Pilates okay. instructor gave me that. I put that on my resume. <laughs> I thought that would be fun. That but, is fun. You know, that keeps your core moving and okay. it prevents folds. Yeah. Uh, or so. I think Pilates is a very good uh, way to avoid back surgery, for example. Yeah. So I think there are ways that we can take care of ourselves if we put ourselves on the map. And I don't think that's being selfish. And yeah. if I wanna take care of my students or my clients, I'm not gonna be any good if I, they're getting leftovers. I've gotta have something to give them. I like that. If I'm giving you leftovers, that, that it's not nutritious. It's, it's That's not right. always. It's, I mean, you know, well, it could be nutritious. I don't want people to stop eating their leftovers. But leftovers, in some cases, is less than maybe what that full meal was when it, when it first came out. Yeah, I I think if we're all running on empty and we're yeah. completely burnt out, yeah. I think it's going to be very hard to be present for our client. And I think if there's anything that's important, it's our presence, whether we're teaching or working with clients, it's showing up and being a real human being and yeah. engaging. So, so when you think about um, how, you know, the stature of Jerry Corey in the counseling profession right now, do you ever ponder about how you got here, how you got to be who you are today? Uh, not too often. And it always surprises me when somebody gives me accolades. But I think, if anything, I followed my interests. And uh, I suppose, and my excitement and my passion. Okay. And, uh, amazing things happened about that. Uh, like, started doing workshops in Ireland, for example. Uh, so I think just simply following a passion and an interest is uh, what's kept me uh, saying, hey, I never thought I would be doing workshops in another country right. or writing right. a book. Yeah, so along those lines, in your book, Personal Reflections on Counseling, you share a lot of nuggets of wisdom, um, things that you have gained 
over the time. Um, you are one of the things you are unapologetically true to who you are and you are very open. You are willing to say, hey, I'm an 84 year old man um, who is doing this work still, planning on continuing to do this work um, here in the mental health field. But can you share, you know, be, you know, one, two nuggets for our listeners to take away? Well, let me see. One of them would be, uh, and I kind of said this already, don't limit ourselves. Don't limit yourself by thinking, oh, I never could never write a could. book or a chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you have to lose if you uh, engage in a project and it doesn't go the way you want it? All right. Uh, so that's one. I think another nugget or gem, if you want to call it, is don't try to do things that are just self-enhancing. Think about how we can make this world a bit better of a place. And I think uh, that's where uh, thinking, okay, I can't do everything, but I can do some things. And that's my greatest joy, yeah. working with people that were undergraduate students that are now making a difference in the profession. Yeah. And uh, so I see that they've challenged themselves. They've been willing to risk. They've gotten mentors. We realize we don't do it alone, that this is a project that we can enjoy with colleagues. Right. And also, I mean, one of the things that you're saying that I'm thinking is that you do it so that others can enjoy it too. Yeah. Right. And, you know, it's, it's really being selfless with yourself and what gifts you have that you can offer so that others can also grow and learn and, and, and be, I guess, impacted by what you're able to share. Right. I think it's reciprocal. I surely get something from teaching a class at University of Holy Cross. Oh, yeah and going to ACA and presenting. And I missed that in the last two years. Yeah. And even doing this, you know, and, uh, and I think it helps us not to think, oh my gosh, what if I said something and it was stupid? Uh, if I censor myself too much, I'm not gonna, I wanna be creative. Well, that's the beauty of vulnerability, right? Yeah. Because I mean, if you say something that you thought that you might not have said when you're when you're able to be vulnerable in that moment and, and 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 actually come back and say this is what i meant by this or this is this this and that that's the authenticness in that and people see that yeah you know you know we don't need a fake apology we need a a real apology in terms of, of something that you know if you say something that might have been offensive or whatever have you um but I, I hear you, you know, um, with that. It's, that's powerful. So we're coming up on the end of our time, but I want to ask you, and you're probably going to tell me that you don't think of this maybe, but um, what is your legacy? You know, I think I wrote about that in the Personal Reflections and Counseling book. Uh -huh. uh, I was asked, and I ask students sometimes, what would you like your legacy to be? Right. And one of the awards I got, and I was teasing with it at ACA a number of years ago, John Carlson, the late John Carlson, yes. gave a half a dozen of us uh, an ACA Living Legends Award. Right. Living Legends. And yeah. I always said I'd rather be a living legend than a dead legend. Than a dead legend. <laughs> and I suppose the most important thing is I'd like to see. Uh, that my work doesn't stop with me. It doesn't begin with me, it doesn't end with me. That somehow, uh, <clears throat> if I'm working with students, that they find their own voice. They find their own God-given talents. That's so important. We each have talents, that they find those talents and then nurture it and be willing to uh, develop and, uh, you know, be who they are and they expect are. people and take small steps towards making a difference in the world. So the biggest thing would be making a difference. 
not even awesome. getting awards. I don't put too much stock in awards. Yeah. You know, I think more important than awards are uh, knowing that we're making a difference, knowing that we're touching lives and for the better. For the better. You know, and helping people to become the person that they would like to become. I think that's what it's all about. And I think teachers can do that and counselors can do that. We're in this business not to cure people, but to help them become who they can become. That's why you're who you are. <laughs> well, I hope so. There's only because you are you 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 are you are so powerful in in, in terms of um, what you represent and how you make the field of counseling so proud um, to to do the work that we do because you helped us. I mean, somewhere deep in the work that I do when I'm teaching, when I'm counseling, when I'm doing all these other things, there's a piece of you in that for that's me. Great. And that's powerful. And that's the, the legacy that I think you will continue. Like you said, you wanted to continue on. Well, you know, I still want to t learn from you. I want to be in one of your classes one of these days. Um, but I can say that having an opportunity to speak with you, to talk with you, to hear from you, to have you sow into me in other ways um, as a colleague, as a counselor, and I think I can call you my friend. Yes. Um, I hope it's, so. it's, it's, it's powerful. It's very, very powerful. And so thank you, Jerry Corey, for being who you are. Um, thank you for allowing yourself to be a part of our experiences in counseling. Thank you. Thank your wife. Thank all of- She deserves a lot. She does. She does. We always have to give homage to, to the women and the people, our partners in our life. Um, and so um, I really, really want to thank you for taking the time out and, and just being a part of the podcast today because your words matter and they've always mattered. Your textbooks are full of words that have helped a lot of us to become the counselors that we have become. So thank you. Well, I sure have appreciated our way of working together. And I have to say, I've enjoyed uh, our work here. So yes. uh, I appreciate and thank you very much for inviting me. Well, thank you for agreeing to be here. Um, this has been the Voice of Counseling. I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler. Today we had the phenomenal Jerry Corey, and we'll see you next time. Yes. ACA provides these podcasts solely for informational and educational purposes. Opinions expressed in these podcasts do not necessarily reflect the view of ACA. ACA is not responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken in reliance upon or as a result of the information and resources provided in this program. This program is copyright 2022 by the American Counseling Association. All rights reserved.